When creating a Pro Tool session, the first thing you have to do obviously is open up the program. So look for this little bell curve shaped icon in the dock. If you click on it and hold the mouse there, if you're unsure what it is, it will reveal the name of the program or the function of what that is inside the program. So you can do that, or you have the choice to go up to the search window up in the upper right hand corner and click the little magnifying glass that brings up spotlight and you can type in Pro Tools. Another choice, if you're inside the finder, you can hit Command Shift A and that brings up the applications window. When this window comes on screen, it's a good idea to read it. It reveals all the different plugins that are occurring. And also this will tell you if there are any sort of problems inside of Pro Tools. If it spends a long time on any particular thing, that is oftentimes something that will make Pro Tools crash. When you get to this window, this is called your dashboard. Be careful with this window. You do not want to just hit create. One of the main problems that I see people do is they will just leave the name of the file untitled. This seems obvious, but you may need to find this and reopen it later. So we would want to give this a specific name. Normally what I'll do, and this is a pretty common naming practice, is I'll name it my client first. My client will hopefully come back and do a bunch of different projects with me. So the project is next. Then the next part is the function. Sometimes you don't have this, but maybe on a project, I might be mixing one day, recording one day. I might be doing ADR. It might be different versions of my edit. I will put that in there so I know what I did that day. And then I'll put the underscore and then the date after that. So in the case of projects for my on-ground school classes, I want you to type in your last name first, the project title, for example, post-production template, underscore the date. And the way that I normally do the date is I just type in numbers. This particular video was done on September 1st, 2019. I will type in 0901, 2019. I'm not gonna hit create yet. I wanna make sure that I'm doing all of the things that are associated with this. The next part is telling me how I'm storing it. I wanna use local storage on most projects unless I'm doing cloud-based collaboration, which is a very advanced technique. If this is one of my earlier sessions, I definitely wanna store this on a local drive on my computer. So local storage, that's just a drive that's inside your computer. If you do happen to do the other thing or you get a weird pop-up window that's asking you to log in, that is because to use cloud-based storage inside of Avid, it's going to make you log in with your Avid login. So down here at the bottom, we have different parameters of our session. So the first one is the file type. Either .wave or AIFF are two different types of non-compressed digital audio. I use the broadcast wave because I like the advanced parameters of the metadata better. So below that, you have the bit depth. You have a choice of three bit depths, 16, 24, or 32-bit floating point. 24-bit is a great way to store your files. This relates to dynamic range, basically the difference between the quietest sound and the loudest sound you can record. In the case of most movie work, you might have to have the quietest sound you could possibly hear, and you might have really, really loud sounds in there as well. So what this gives you is 144 dB of dynamic range. So it goes from the quietest sound well past the threshold of pain, which of course you don't need. So in terms of sample rates for video projects, you wanna work at 48K, that's the digital video standard. You can use higher sample rates as well. You can go to 88 or 96 or higher sample rates, but those will oftentimes create problems with the processing on your computer if you have a lot of tracks or if you have certain types of plugins. 48K is also the minimum sample rate to be classified as high resolution audio, according to the Recording Academy, the people who award the Grammys. And this relates to the lowest frequency sound you can hear and also the highest treble frequency sound you can hear. The theoretical human hearing range is 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. We need to times that by two for something called the Nyquist theorem, which we would talk about in other lectures. IO settings is another important thing. You do not want to use last used. That is a grave sin a lot of times. Sometimes it'll work for you, but a good place to start, particularly on more basic systems like things with an Mbox or just the onboard computer, is you want to just go to Stereo Mix. This is your default setup. If you have more advanced setups, maybe you want to be dealing in 5.1, 
but I wouldn't do that unless you really know what you're doing. The IO settings are how it's arranging the outputs to the speakers. So the next thing which is really important is where you store your files. You don't want to just hit create here yet. By default, most of the time, there is a preset location, which is dangerous because you don't know who set that or where they set it to. So most of the time, I set up prompt for location, and that allows me to choose where it goes. If you get a small window like this, click this little triangle, and then it will open it up and give you the entire file structure. Most professional environments and most educational environments will hopefully have a separate drive where you store your media aside from your internal drive. So once I've done that, I've selected it, I will click Save, and then I have my new session.